Good morning, church. Amen. In Christ alone, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. He is the Lion of Judah. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We have great cause to rejoice and to celebrate this morning. Let's stand and give God the glory, the Lion and the Lamb. Yeah. 
Good to see you, Southside Baptist Church. Good to be here today. Thankful for you. Thankful that you're here. It is going to be a wonderful day here as we gather, as we celebrate, as we simply make much of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you are here today and visiting with us, if you are a guest, we want you to know we are thrilled, we are thankful, we're humbled that you have come and been with us here today. We hope you're blessed, we hope you feel at home, and we want to welcome you back anytime that the doors are open. A uh, couple of quick things I want to share with you. It's been a very busy week here at Southside Baptist. A couple of really great things took place this past week. Uh, one of the things, the Lord has blessed us with, with our new building across the street, and we're just constantly looking for ways that we can use it for ministry. And uh, one of the things we did this past week, you might have saw something about it on, on social media, uh, we invited the girls, high school girls softball team, their coaches, who are both members here at the church, and their kids' parents to our Life Center. We fed them a nice meal. I prayed for them, shared the gospel with them, uh, and it was just a really, really great thing. And that's something we're going to try to do. I said try to do for every high school sports team here in Caldwell County throughout the year. And uh, something really cool was happening. We were kind of putting the chairs up after service, and a man came up to me and said, are you the pastor of the church? I said, yes, sir, I am. Kyle Knopfsinger is my name. And, and he had a lot of questions about Southside. And uh, I said, I asked where he was going to church. He told me where he was a member of, but he hasn't been in, in quite a while. And I said, listen, man, Easter's coming up. Why don't you bring your family to Southside on Easter Sunday? And he talked like he would. Uh, I'm going to follow up with him this week. And uh, just kind of a neat thing for us to do, not just uh, for ourselves, but for our community. And that was really, really neat and thankful we had the opportunity to do that. Also, though, something else that was really cool, yesterday we had a work day. And it was a work day day we got a lot of stuff done and uh, pretty much we've still got to put some more chairs out but we're gonna wait and do that after youth on Wednesday night but our gymnasium across the street is ready for Easter and uh, we are looking forward to that it's going to be a wonderful wonderful time I was hesitant I've had this number on my heart for a couple of weeks now and, and I was hesitant to share it but this is the number that I've been praying for, for Easter Sunday, all right? You might think I'm nuts, but it won't be the first or the last time. 500 people. 500 people in our Life Center one week from today. That's the number that I've been praying for. And I hope and pray that you will not just pray for that number. I hope and pray that over the next few days, you will work for that number. Call Southside people, folks we haven't seen in a while. Get them over here, call your friends. Easter is a wonderful time to invite someone to church. We didn't have Easter last year. Sitting at home watching me preach to an empty sanctuary was not Easter. We haven't had Easter for two years. People are ready to get back to normal. So I want to encourage you, reach out to friends, family, whomever you can think of, and, and, and invite people to Southside on Easter Sunday. I'm actually going to be on the radio Wednesday morning here, uh, here at the local radio station talking about our Easter service. And uh, so those are some things that I'm doing. Something else, and we talked about this Wednesday night, Something else that I'm going to be doing this week. Uh, Monday through Friday, I'm going to skip lunch. I am going to fast and pray during my scheduled lunch hour each day. And Wednesday evening, we talked a lot in Bible study about fasting. And uh, I asked them, I'm asking you. I'm not asking you to go on a hunger strike. I'm asking you to simply set aside time, maybe some time that you might watch TV or read before bed. And instead of doing some regular activity, set aside time and devote it to prayer for Easter Sunday. All right. It's going to be a great day next week. It's going to be a great day here today. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. 
Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done, for the ways that you have blessed us. We thank you for the opportunity to gather, to celebrate, and to serve you. Father, I pray, Lord, that you would have full, complete, and absolute control of this service. May everything said and done be pleasing unto you. Father, we love you. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good things are happening. Amen. Good things have happened. Good things are happening. We celebrate all the good things in the Lord. It would be okay if we embarrassed you by having 600, wouldn't it? Yeah, I thought so. Let's embarrass you. How about that? I love this story, this song. It tells the whole story of Christ in the church. Let's stand and sing it out. Amen. King of kings. It's Palm Sunday, I believe. And he entered the gates. He said, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were expecting an earthly king. He is an earthly king. They're expecting a kingdom right then. But he is the king of all kings, not just the king of Israel. Amen. Praise God. In the darkness we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came run. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and promise to a virgin king the world. From a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
when he entered the city that day, he knew where he was headed. God said he set his face toward Jerusalem, towards the cross. He was headed to die for my sin and your sin. The King of Kings sacrificing himself for us that we might be saved.
and belief and will be saved God I pray in your holy name Amen you may be saved can we just take a second and give the Lord praise for the job these folks do up here every Sunday I, uh, I get here to the church early not as early as they do but I get here to the church early, and uh, I'm, I'm back in my office. I'm just kind of looking over my notes, making some last-minute changes, underlining some things that I want to emphasize, and, and I just I hear them practicing. And uh, it just, for lack of a better term, it just gets me pumped. And uh, I, love, I love being in my office, listening to them as they rehearse, but I love even more being out here with you being led in worship by them, and we are so blessed and, and so thankful. It is seven days a week before Easter, and I thought that you and I would take our time this morning and spend our time together in what is no doubt your favorite book of the Bible, the book of Leviticus. I'm quite certain that all of you were up to the wee hours of the night reading this book, memorizing scripture, really understanding more about what God says about which animals are free to be eaten and, and things like that. But, but we're, that's where we're going to be today, the week prior to Easter. Because as you know, the past few weeks, we have just been looking at some Old Testament stories that really give us some insight into the Easter that is coming. We begin in Genesis 22, where we looked at God providing a substitute in the stead of Abraham's only son, Isaac. We looked a couple of weeks ago about how God poured out the tenth and final plague on Egypt, and we saw how the Lord passed over the children of Israel. Well, this morning, with our time together, we're going to look together at the subject of Easter the Lord atones. Now, you heard me kind of make light of the book of Leviticus and our relationship with it, but the reality is Leviticus is a challenging book to read. One of the main reasons is there's almost no narrative in the book. Like, you don't read about the sagas of people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph like you do in Genesis. You don't read about Moses and the Exodus and the wilderness and the children of Israel like you do in the book of Exodus. In fact, Leviticus really sets the tone for what it's all about in the bookend verses of the book. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 1 says, The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, and then the last verse of Leviticus says in 2734, these are the commandments that the Lord commanded Moses for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. So literally, Israel was camped around Mount Sinai. And while there, they get a big, long list of do's and don'ts. That was literally their Bible study while they were there. Well, what we're going to do this morning, we're going to look together, as I said, Leviticus chapter 16. We're going to read 22 verses of this book, verse 1, looking down through verse 22. Let's pay attention to the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. 
when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat, but in this way Aaron shall come into the holy place. With a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body and he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on and he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats and one lot for the Lord and one for the other lot, Azazel. And Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself and he shall take a censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of sweet incense beaten small and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it within his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat for, and, in, and in front of the mercy seat. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting, which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area and he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness." That was exhausting to read to you just now. There weren't any hard words in the text. It certainly wasn't Genesis, so-and-so begat so-and-so, begat so-and-so, and then so-and-so died. It, it wasn't that. But man, that was some weighty, heavy stuff. So before we begin to try to unpack any of that, let me just kind of explain to you what we just read. What the Lord told Aaron the high priest to do on this day was what he would have to do every day a single time for each year. This was a very important day 
in the Jewish calendar. It was known as Yom Kippur, which literally means the Day of Atonement. This was an annual event that the high priest had to do. So with that in mind, let's just kind of pick out some things that we see from these 22 verses and see how they imply not just to you and I today, but see how they apply to everyone, everywhere, at every time. The first thing we need to see from our text is this. Number one, we need to see the holy presence of the Lord. The holy presence of God. Now, what I want us to do real quick, go back and linger just a bit on verse 1 and 2. See if you pick up something that might pique your interest a little bit. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, your brother, not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat that is on the ark so that he may not die. Apparently, what we just read informs us something about the presence of God. Because what we just read says to us, Two young men have already died, and the potential for more human death is very, very real. Now, you heard me say in the introduction that in the story or in the book of Leviticus that there wasn't a lot of narrative. There wasn't a lot of story, and and that's true, there's not, but, but there is one story. And to be honest with you, it's quite disturbing. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1, 2, and 3 might shed some light on what we just read. Now, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And the fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord has said, Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified, and before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That story of the sons of Aaron... And the first two verses of our text this morning really shed light on something you and I need to know. We don't get to go to God any way we choose. We don't get to define the terms of our relationship with God. Those aren't our rules to make. God sets the terms and conditions of our relationship. And if any time, any place, anywhere, those terms and conditions are not followed, not just something bad, something deadly occurs. These two boys offered unauthorized fire and died. Moses says to Aaron and all of Israel, don't just go anyway into the presence of the Lord. You may die. In the Old Testament, Moses, who's writing this book and saying these words, Moses wanted to see the glory of God. And God said to Moses, you can't see it. But here's what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of a rock. I'll shield your face. And as I am passing by, I will let you catch a glimpse of me. When the prophet Isaiah encounters the presence of the Lord in the temple, he falls to the ground and begins confessing every sin he's committed and every sin of every person he knows. In the New Testament, John the Apostle, old man John, exiled on the island of Patmos, the beloved apostle, the one who Jesus entrusted the care of his mother with. John the Apostle, when he sees the risen Christ, to use his words, falls to the earth as though he were dead. 
presence of God is awesome. The presence of God is glorious. The presence of God is terrifying. And in some cases, deadly. Now, you might be sitting here saying to yourself, listen, preacher, based upon everything you have just said, you know what? I think I'm going to just stay as far away from God's presence as I possibly can. This sounds like something I want no part of. This sounds like something I don't need to really put on my calendar. This sounds like something I just need to avoid. I understand. Here's what you need to understand. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. The same God that Moses couldn't catch a glimpse of, the same God that Isaiah saw in the temple, the same God that John encountered on the island of Patmos, the same God who struck down the children of Aaron because of unauthorized fire, that same God, according to Scripture, you and I have a date with at some point in the future. We must all stand before the presence of God, the judgment seat of Christ. We don't get to define the terms of this relationship. And those who have tried to define it, it didn't end well. There is a holy presence of God. But not only that, we also see something else in the text. We see the humble means of approaching God. Now here's what we need to understand. Aaron didn't get to go into the presence of God whenever he wanted. And Aaron didn't get to go in the presence of God however he wanted. Aaron was the high priest. Now, you and I might not really pay a lot of attention to this, and we might not really, we might kind of stumble over that. But the reality is, as Aaron being the high priest, he was a pretty important guy. Aaron was a pretty big deal. Everyone knew who Aaron was. When Aaron walked down the street, everyone knew that's Aaron, that's the high priest. Such a big deal was Aaron that out of the 1,189 chapters in the Bible, an entire chapter and several other isolated references are devoted to what he's supposed to wear. Exodus 28, a long chapter by the way, is all about the high priest clothing and how he's supposed to look. Listen to what it says. Exodus 28, 2 through 5, And you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for, the glo for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with the spirit of skill, and they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, and his sons to serve me as priest. They shall receive gold, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen. Aaron was the sharpest dressed man in town. 364 days a year. But not this day. He left those fine threads, those fine clothes woven by workers who, according to God, he poured out his skill on so they had some mad sewing skills. He left all of that aside. And on this day, what does he wear? Verse 4. 
He shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have a linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He is to put on the most simple, the most modest, the most mundane of clothing when he goes into my presence. I don't want you to dress up when you come into my presence. I want you, Aaron High Priest, to dress down when you come into my presence. Aaron is not to strut into the holy of holies, all high priestly like. He is to dress humbly, and he is to go in humility into the presence of the Lord. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We do not walk into the presence of God all churchy-like. We do not walk into the presence of God with our best foot forward. We walk into the presence of God with a spirit of humility that says, I have no business being here. I'm not qualified to be here. I'm not good enough to be here. I'm not right enough to be here. Aaron was making a fashion statement. I don't belong here. But God has beckoned me to come whenever a man woman boy or girl is saved if they are truly born again it is the most humble moment of their life Lord God I am a sinner and I as a sinner am deserving of your judgment But because you love me so much that you did for me something I do not deserve, you gave your only son to die in my place for my sin, I humbly accept your invitation. There's a holy presence of God There's a humble means of approaching God. And finally, we see towards the end of our text the healing of our relationship with God. Aaron had to jump through all kinds of hoops. Before he could make atonement for the sins of the people, he had to atone for his own sin and the sin of his own family. Listen to what the Bible says in verse 15 and then verse 20 through 22. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. Now look at verse 20 through 22. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat and Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area and he shall let the goat go free in the wilderness one animal dies for the sins of the people this at this point in the game south side this really shouldn't be a shock to you a ram caught in a thicket died so isaac could be spared 
A Passover lamb was slaughtered at twilight so the inhabitants of the houses of Israel could be passed over in God's judgment. On this day, an animal was offered up in the stead of the people to be sacrificed for their sin. And after this happens, there's another animal. And Aaron would then go out and he would place his hands upon the head of this other animal. And he would confess all the sin of Israel over this animal. And it would be sent away alive out into the wilderness, never again to be seen, symbolizing that their sin had been paid for and that their sin had been carried away. And they did this every single year. And here on this day, the sin of the people of Israel was atoned for. That word atonement, if you're wondering what it means, you can really break it down into threes. Atonement literally means at one mint. On this day, Israel was at one with their God. This was the only way. This is how it was done. And it was done every year. It was a solution. But it wasn't a permanent solution. It was a fix. But it was a temporary fix. But then we read in Hebrews 9, 11 through 15, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption. For if by the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer, sanctity for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance inheritance since death since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant Christ the high priest appeared in a greater tent not with the blood of bulls and rams but with his own blood once for all that we might receive eternal promise look around this place go to the life center there's no holy of holies here I've never killed an animal in my life except with my car I don't slaughter animals on a daily basis we don't go about offering sacrifices we don't atone for sins I don't go out into the presence of God because I might die if I do it improperly we come here each and every week celebrating what our eternal high priest has done for us Jesus Christ who atoned once and for all for all our sins and he beckons us into his presence to be saved we don't set the terms of the relationship we don't strut into his presence but by his grace we go because his blood was shed for us be saved today sinners Come to Christ today. This is it. This is all there is. C.S. Lewis, 
in his Chronicles of Narnia series. We've got an exchange between a little girl, Jill, and Aslan, the lion, who symbolizes Jesus. Are you not thirsty? said the lion. I am dying of thirst, said Jill. Then drink, said the lion. May I, could I, would you mind going away while I do, said Jill. The lion answered this only by a look and a very low growl. And as Jill gazed at its motionless bulk, she realized that she might as well have asked the whole mountain to move aside for her convenience. The delicious rippling noise of the stream was driving her nearly frantic. Will you promise not to do anything to me if I do come, said Jill. I make no promise, said the lion. Jill was so thirsty now that without noticing it, she had come a step nearer. Do you eat little girls? She said. I have swallowed up girls and boys, women and men, kings and emperors, cities and realms, said the lion. It didn't say this as if it were boasting, nor as if it were sorry, nor as if it were angry. It just said it. I dare not come and drink, said Jill. Then you will die of thirst, said the lion. Oh dear, said Jill, coming another step nearer. I suppose I must go and look for another stream then. There is no other stream, said the lion. If you are thirsty, come and drink of the living water of Jesus but friends be warned there is no other stream you come and you be at one with God today and every day until you stand in his presence and hear those glorious words stand in his awesome, terrifying, sometimes deadly presence and hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. You come today. I want to ask Dane if you would to come. Our musicians be making their way forward. This is it. No other way. No other stream. We don't define the terms. You yield yourself to Christ and his terms. And you come today and you be saved. Please come to Christ today. Father, bless this time of response. Do with it, Lord, as you see fit. In Christ's name, amen. Stand together, please. On a hill far away Stood an old rugged cross The end suffering and shame and I love that old 